Hello, everybody, and welcome to Cinema Savvy. It is myself, George, joined once more by Tom and Paul for another entry in the James Cameron retrospective. And this week, we are talking about the 1989 film The Abyss, the one that exists that we cannot buy on Blu-ray or 4K, and I'm saying it in the opening statement because it's a very heated discussion online when people do bring up this film. But before we get into any of that sort of stuff, how are we all doing tonight? Yeah, very well, thanks. Uh, you know, ready to talk about the abyss. Yep. I, I <laughs> stared long into the abyss, and the <laughs> abyss stared back at me. <laughs> wow. It's, it's one of those where, you know, you should... <laughs> To get the real primal viewing experience, maybe we all needed to, to, to yeah. almost drown underwater to then watch it as the way James maybe Cameron intended. We need to watch it on a submarine or something, or just uh, we need to. Maybe I should have just watched it while sat in my bath. That would have maybe <laughs> the way James Cameron intended to be soaking wet all the time. It's going to be one of those like it's it's going to be one of those, and and, and we're going to get into it because it's such a. It's a film that's, I feel, famous for its behind-the-scenes antics without disrespecting the, the film itself and the cast. But maybe also because it's not been released, so no one's probably heard of it that didn't have a copy before, like HD was a thing. It's a very strange thing to get into, but we're going to try and get into that properly tonight whilst talking about behind-the-scenes, whilst talking about James Cameron, some of the characters, and everything else. So we want to hear from you at home. Comment your thoughts on The Abyss, if you've seen the film. Um, do you own the film? That's a big segment we do in this James Cameron series, and this episode is one of the big reasons as to why this is unfortunately a segment. And uh, if you enjoy this review, do check out the rest of the channel. We've got a couple of other James Cameron ones before. This is the halfway point of the series. We're, of course, ending up the Titanic um, because we've already done the avatars, which are in the playlist for you to have a look at. And if you enjoy the video, we're not really fuming, we've been mocking you know, people's uh, uh, the way of water as such. You can get to us on our social medias. Cinema Savvy, at Cinema underscore Savvy on Twitter and Instagram, Facebook and Airbus.com slash Cinema Savvy. A link to Red Bubble in the description where you can pick up some merch to support the channel. Um, but before we pick off, uh, Tom, you we were on last week with Aliens, which was a great video. Uh, and Paul, I'm going to put you on the spot. Can you remember, uh, similar to the Spielberg series, can you remember the first James Cameron film you might have seen or your earliest memories of a James Cameron film? My earliest memory of a James Cameron film is not actually watching it. I just remember I had an Aliens era alien toy when I was like, oh. I don't know, five. And that was not, I'd never seen it. I just remember thinking the alien toy looked cool. And it was like, why does a, why does a five-year-old have an alien toy? <laughs> um, but I think the first film, I, I think the first one I saw was Titanic. I think that was the first James Cameron movie I watched. And I was like, this is awful. And then re-watching it now, I'm like, oh my God, the love story is so true. <laughs> and then I've then I watched Aliens, Terminator, everything. I've not seen Way of Water yet. And... Oof. Wow. If we stick to our sort of weekly, as we're recording what the box office is, it's now over to No Way Home. And it sits at over $1.9 billion. We're recording this a week before this is going to air. So as I say every week, who knows what it's going to be next week. It, it doesn't... I guess it's just that old Twitter statement is you just can't doubt James Cameron. The very thing people kept mocking was every time someone said that for like the last three years, like don't doubt James Cameron. Some There was some snide Marvel fan laughing in the comments um, to which James Cameron... Yeah, I was, I'm not surprised. probably doesn't care anyway. I'll, I'll catch it on telly. I just, I, I've not got the, I don't know. I didn't like the first Avatar. I was like, yeah, this lacks everything I like about James Cameron films. Nobody nearly died. I like, I like, like if you don't nearly die doing a James Cameron movie, have you done a James, <laughs> you know, I, I, I want some, I want some people getting sick, breaking their legs, jumping on things. And, you know, when it's all CGI, I don't know. I'm, I'm not an He's advocate. become mellowed in his older age. I, I guarantee you that is not true. I guarantee. <laughs> also, that's the other thing is it's a bit like the reason he only he's only made like ten films is because if he made any more, he'd die of a heart attack. The man is the man is like like we did the Spielberg series like a nice granddad figure that's like let's just make a nice little sci-fi film and we'll we'll you know we'll do some stuff it'll be nice and then James Cameron's like if you don't do it exactly how I want it 
I'll nail gun you to death. <laughs> it's this is what I've loved about this series so far is that I think Aliens was Aliens was the first time we got to really hear about him on set. Um now obviously the Terminator is great because it's more like the arrogance of him younger and Aliens is him. He's becoming a bigger name. He's done two, you know, two big films and heading into the abyss, I guess, for tonight. This is gonna be like the behind the scenes film to talk about. Um, for, for better or worse, we don't know. But obviously, this is following on from doing Terminator and Aliens. And uh, his fascination with water is going to be evident for the first time on screen since Piranha, which he brackets, hasn't directed, but brackets did direct, and we still don't know. And that's going to be an enigma in, until the end of time. Um, I until think, maybe I think from how much he loves water, he definitely directed it. It's it's and he really wanted. I mean, the the, the fact that the the idea for Terminator came from a nightmare of him being ill because he flew to Italy because he was so desperate to continue working on Piranha Two. That's that's a story in, in itself worth looking into. Saying he obviously did have something to do with it then, but um, it, it's going to be a strange one tonight because this is where how would we put it? Not things get difficult or tricky, but. I think a lot of people are going to come into this knowing the Ed Harris stuff, but we're going to talk about it as well. Uh, and obviously setting up, you know, we know that the without jumping too far ahead, you know, there's a few more water films of his, most notably Titanic, which we'll be doing at the end of the series. Um, <clears throat> some of the behind-the-scenes stories are just going to be amazing. But um, before we get into any of that stuff, for anyone that isn't familiar at the moment, let's do the IMDb plot synopsis, where, nice and simple this week, a civilian diving team is enlisted to search for a lost nuclear submarine and faces danger while encountering an alien aquatic species. Uh, spoiler alert for anyone that hasn't seen it. Um, and I'm glad I read this before I watched it because I, giving my memories of this film, I have known nothing about The Abyss. I didn't know it was a James Cameron film until about three, four years ago. I'd never heard of it, if I'm being completely honest. The only conversations I've ever heard about The Abyss... And maybe this is because I'm younger, and I'd love people to correct me. Um, I only ever hear about it when it's to quote James Cameron gives an update on why the Abyss isn't on Blu-ray or 4K yet. That's that's genuinely the the sum entity of Avatar Two was coming out. A lot of people were rewatching James Cameron films, and it gets the Abyss, and it's like I'm a massive fan of the Abyss. Someone tweets, "It's not out on 4K yet," and I'm there. Like I know none of us can watch it properly, but um, I feel that there's no there's not a no history because that's disrespectful, but I certainly feel like younger people like myself or or people that want to like find these old works from these big directors. It's just not something that's ever brought up. And it's before we get to the avatar, there's no cultural impact nonsense. It's not because of that. It's just that it's inaccessible to view. You literally can't watch it unless like you're really old school, like not really old school, but. I don't know. It's a weird one, Tom. I'm just going to hand over to you because I know you had seen this and you're the first one I got to recruit on this expedition to cover this film. Yeah. Uh, and I remember being really enthused about it last week on Aliens. <laughs> and, well, we'll get into that. But, <laughs> um, yeah, I, you know, I, I, I suppose I don't really necessarily have a, you know, a distinct memory of when I first watched it I think it must have been on on TV or something years and years ago but I remember liking it at the time and subsequent watches I've remembered liking it uh and literally just before recording I I've just just finished it for the well for the upteenth time and have seemed to do a complete 180 on it so that's I suppose spoiler for where for where I'm going today <laughs> Yeah, I, I think I'd seen it on VHS or something. Like, I remember my, my uncle, uh, all my family, like, it, my taste in film comes from, like, all my family members all having different interests. And one of my uncles is, like, big into sci-fi that p other people don't like. So he was the one that told me to watch Alien 3. He was like, it's the best alien. He's incorrect, but... And he was like, oh, you should watch The Abyss. The Abyss is great. And I was, I remember watching it, and I remember just being freaked out by it. And I never went back. And I'm still terrified of, like, the ocean. Like, I've said several times, I would sooner go to the furthest reaches of space than chance what's at the bottom of the ocean. Because, like, 
There's going to be some fucked up shit down there. Like, There's I'm, stuff that the humanity will never discover. I, that's my belief. I am I am terrified. Like, did you guys ever see Underwater with Christian Stewart? That's like my nightmare. Mm. Like, you go to the bottom of the ocean. You know, people are like, oh, we eventually we'll get to go through the Mariana Trench. Don't do it. <laughs> There's stuff there that, like, you'll wake up Cthulhu, man. Don't do it. Like a megalodon's the least of our worries. There's going to be like there's going to be a whole subaquatic race, and this film plays into my fear that there's stuff at the bottom of the ocean. <laughs> I'm like, I wouldn't. Don't try it, guys. It's messed up. There's a reason why we'll get crushed to death. James Cameron will do it. He'll create a submarine, and he'll go through that trench, and he'll come out the, and he'll finally be happy. But uh, he has got to the lowest. Sorry to jump in. He has he has done the record, hasn't he? Has he been to the lowest uh, human? Uh, I think he's got the record. He got he went so deep he's now bulletproof. Like you can't kill him. He went so deep in the ocean that he came out of Disney's like we're going to make four more Avatar films. He, I'm telling you right. Whenever when he finishes making Avatar four, he'll go to the premiere. It will get a standing ovation, and then what he'll do is he'll walk out the cinema, walk straight to the ocean, wade out into the water, and like like the original Little Mermaid, he'll burst into foam. And his spirit will go to the depths of the type, the actual Titanic, and suddenly it'll be—you know—the first person at the end of Titanic where they're all there smiling, <laughs> and DiCaprio turns around and he's finally become Rose, and he lives in the afterlife forever aboard the Titanic. <laughs> that is what's going to happen. <laughs> I'm trying to. I, I guess he's like the parallel of Tom Cruise, right? Tom Cruise's destiny is, is to do this film in space and never return. And I love Tom Cruise. And I've had this fear for a while. We might not see him once he goes to space for this film. Uh, it'll be so horribly fitting. And I think you're right. There's something like James Cameron that... He'll go to the planet from Scientology. He'll go to the Scientology planet. That's what he's doing. He's not making he's a film. That's what I find like. They're letting him take a camera up there. And I'm like, oh my God, Like we're never going to... You know, it's like the first dog that went to space, wasn't it? That they just left there. Or was it a monkey? I can't remember. Um, well, the like of the dog. There was something that was sent to space that never came down as they tested his like, four year old my four year old is massively into space and we learned about the dog that went to space and he was like and he's still up there. I'm like <laughs> He was like, That dog's old now in space. I'm like, that dog is <sighs> Sorry. I don't want to break your heart, you sweet child. <laughs> the dog is a skeleton <laughs> in a bomb. <laughs> And that's going to be you know what scares me? The, the concept of infinity. I, I never cared until someone put it on Facebook once. That they were scared of it. And then I thought about it. I was like, yeah, that's actually quite scary. But uh, I'm no, get... much happier being in space than in the water. There's There are some fish are terrifying. It's like... It's sharks. Sharks are the worst creature in the world. And that's what I can't... Sharks, but at least sharks look normal. There are so, like, those ones that got the little light and then they're just like a set of teeth with fins. No. I don't know why James Cameron wants to go into the ocean, but that's what's going to happen. He'll wade into the ocean and his spirit will be one with the Titanic and he'll be happy, finally. It's and we'll be stuck with more Avatar films. <laughs> well, we know, we're getting, we know we're getting two and three <clears throat> confirmed. No, three and four. Are th I, don't, I can't remember how they did it. Two had to make X amount of money to then confirm the next two, even though he needs three, four, and five being confirmed, not... I'm I'm lost with the Avatar. I think they're just going to fund all of them, and James Cameron's made it a game to to talk about them potentially not being made because Disney aren't going to not say yes when they make I money. Would, and I, I would play an Avatar video, like an open world Avatar. There is going to be one next year. Oh, yeah, it's delayed early from this year. And there was a really good PS3 game in the first game came out, which uh, doesn't get talked about enough. Just to get some more gaming references in there. Yeah, um, I, but, I, do game of it. I don't want to watch film of it. Is that is that is that is that Avatar game going to be surprise Avatar Six? <laughs> I've taken it one step it. further. I've made a game. I just, it, it's just no. It's surprise. It, it's true lies too. <laughs> that's the wow. real. That's the real would, shot. The stealth sequel to True Lies. Like as as much as I want to keep to my Avatar, we have to talk about the Abyss because I, I, I'm just going to end on the the amazing Vin Diesel isn't actually an Avatar news. If anyone knew about this, that. Vin Diesel went to the Avatar set like a year or two ago, kind of implied he was an Avatar 3, and everyone lost their shit. Like, oh my god, it's Vin Diesel actually doing a non-Fast and Furious film. And now this week he's confirmed that it was taken out of context, he was just visiting the set, he wasn't actually an Avatar. To which I'm... 
massively disappointed that we're not going to see Vin Diesel playing a blue alien uh, in motion. Oh man, and those movies are all about family. He loves that. Oh man, he loves, we've been robbed. He loves playing aliens and talking about family. Plot we've twist: robbed. Avatar Five is Riddick Four. He goes I do think, to Pandora. I do think we'll get Arnie at some point. Uh, I'm convinced we will get Arnie in an Avatar I'm film at some he point. He can play Quaritch. I'm really upset. That's... Could you make Arnie is Quaritch? Guys, this is Papa Dragon. Give me the unobtainium. <laughs> I don't like the aliens. Ow, no. Listen to me. The planet is unobtainium. I love Stephen Lang, but... Arnie Stephen Lang is the best thing about the Avatar films, though. Aside from the tech, Stephen Lang is like. If Bill Paxton wasn't Quaritch, he'd have put some juice on that. There was, I mean, we're not considering we're not doing Avatar in the series. I don't mind having that quick chat because he isn't in this film, unfortunately. And we'll get to talk about him um, uh, in a couple more weeks. But Bill Paxton, I believe that James Cameron said they 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 were going to have him in one of the sequels. Um, I don't know if it was Avatar 2 or if it was meant to be one of the later ones, but apparently it spoke. Uh, and I don't think James Cameron is the kind of guy that would lie about that for for a for a quotation out there. I think I think Cameron when no, it comes to his actual also, friends like, is pretty on the ball. Well, like isn't like the, the Abyss and Avatar are like the only two movies of James Cameron's that Bill Paxton's not in. Terminator he's, two, I think. I could be wrong. Oh, Terminator. Because he's in Terminator 1. Yeah, he's in Terminator 1. That's why, yeah. But yeah, no, it's correct. It's 100%. Aliens, yeah. True Lies he's in. Titanic yeah, he's Titanic. in. Yeah. And it's uh, it, it's just what one of those where that's one of the big what ifs me. And this is it. That I, I think the big thing is that Quaritch is the best character from Avatar. Um, and it kind of makes me wish I was talking about Avatar, not The Abyss, if I'm being honest. Um, the Abyss has nothing to see in it. That's a James Cameron guy. <laughs> yeah, another yeah. colonial marine following last week. He's Michael Bean is a fascinating one, but uh, yeah, I think he's been. Has he been in anything since T two? I might be wrong. See, he was in like the. Is it the deleted scene or extended? There's so many of these special editions that James Cameron does. He really needs to. He's a he's a George Lucas in the best complimentary manner, um, uh, and it does boggle me sometimes about how you know. Not these get made, but his his cycle of making films, the people he works with. I'm, I love hearing the stories because you think, why would anyone work with him again? And they all do. Even Kate wins of it, who said she'd never work with Titanic. She'd have a tattoo. Well, so, I, the, it's just... the, quote, the quote I read about Kate Winslet, she said, unless I got paid a lot of money. And I'm assuming that a cement mixer full of money was driven to her house with the Avatar script pinned to it. And she went, all right. Also, just a good thing. We're going to talk about the fact that, you know, people nearly drowned making The Abyss. If I heard that he was making a CGI film set in water, you'd be like, oh, that means that we won't actually have to drown to make the film. That's perfect. And then you see the footage of Kate Winslet underwater. If I was Kate Winslet, I'd be like, what's the point in doing CGI then if I've got to drown? Like, the whole idea of, you know, is that I don't have to drown to death. And you're making me hold my breath for like 10 minutes. I'd be like, it's not worth it. Also, if I was in an Avatar film and I had to play a human, not worth it. I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm with Ed Norton on that. The fact that Edward Norton said he got offered a human in Avatar and he went, no. If I'm not playing a, an alien, I'm not interested. I'm with Edward Norton. I'd be like, nah, I'm not playing a human. Imagine Ed Norton as an Avatar. Like, he'd be like a sophisticated, like seven foot, like blue monster. That would like just cause absolute chaos. I'm playing a human. I'm not playing a human in a Planet of the Apes <laughs> film. I'm playing an ape, or I'm not in it. <laughs> no, that's a good point. Oh, I really want to talk about Avatar, but we can't. <clears throat> that is genuinely a sign of how the Abyss conversation is going to go. I honestly feel that. If there's any hardcore fans of the Abyss, please just comment and we'll apologise in advance. The, the, but, the, um, Abyss yep. is, the Abyss is a film that would be... The Abyss is what I would call a perfect remake film. Because the idea is good. Yeah. The execution one is tech. kind of boring. <laughs> it, yeah, like, just my, my initial thoughts. Like, I feel I was very, very surprised. I mean, I, I say it's like, oh, this feels like a typical 90s film just off the bat. Obviously, it's 89, which for all intents and purposes is almost the 1990s. But 
it's certainly a film that if I'm going to be really polite to begin with and give some opening thoughts, I think is ahead of itself by a couple of decades. Um, I, I think that akin to Avatar, which I think he started developing in the early 90s as well, he didn't do that because the technology wasn't ready. George Lucas didn't do the Star Wars prequels because the technology wasn't ready in the 90s. Um, I, I feel that The Abyss, I think, is fundamentally in that in that zone, even though it, for most of it looks fine. I think where the tech is, you've kind of said it perfect. If there was a perfect remake to do, I think the, if The Abyss was done today, it'd be a completely different film and a much better film. Uh, and for and I think we'll probably end up with things like that in the Avatar films moving forward with the whole underwater filming where the cast is still holding their breath for seven minutes at a time uh, because they're not allowed to breathe to have bubbles come out, which messes the motion capture, which I thought was the most amazing behind-the-scenes facts from Avatar The Way of Water. Um, but let's talk this. Let's talk some production slash behind-the-scenes. The real reason you're all here tonight. Um, and I guess, as we always do, we'll try and begin with the content for this. So, James Cameron, a kid George, I love comparing with George Lucas because there is some of these mad similarities between them. James Cameron was at school, the age of 17, and the story is, is that he attended a lecture by somebody that was like a deep sea diver. Couldn't tell you or <clears> pronounce it. <throat> um, but this individual was the first ever person to breathe fluid in his lungs through a university study. And essentially, following on from this, James Cameron then wrote a short story about following this event, which a lot of these ideas for his concepts terminated coming in the dream. Aliens is alien with the dollar sign, which is still my favorite antidote for, for a film I've ever seen, which is so on the ball. Um, that basically, whilst he was making Aliens, he saw a documentary about you know the North Atlantic, and he started getting flashbacks to his short story he wrote at the age of 17. So he decided it would be his next film, The Abyss. Um, now, I, I'll give him credit for this. The film doesn't come across like a 17-year-old wrote it. Um, actually, it feels like it's written by somebody who's like at the end of a failing marriage, which I don't want to get into too much, but that is like a core of the film, and that actually ended up being very real, that they, him and his wife divorced after filming finished. Um, there's probably some behind-the-scenes we'll never find out about that happened there on this film. Um, but um, just quickly to you both, what are your thoughts on... Because I guess it's it's a great thing for original films. Granted, it wasn't as much as a problem in the 80s compared to today. That it's a short story he came up when he was younger. The success, obviously, of Aliens back-to-back -back with uh, Terminator would have obviously given the studio the, the reason to give him the green light. What are just your thoughts before we even get into filming on, on that premise? Uh, oof, uh, blimey! So I don't really know where to where to start. Um, <laughs> uh, I think I think to be to be honest, it's it's you know Cameron and, and ideas. It's just ludicrous how he gets. It's just you like you you think he's just completely mad, and well, he I mean he is really. Let's let's, <laughs> let's be perfectly honest. Um, but it's just nonsense, isn't it? It's just like oh, I I I dreamt it or i wrote it when i was 17 and and came came up with the, the idea 55 years later when i remembered my my short story i wrote it's it's ludicrous and, and, and nonsense i mean to be to be fair though the um conceptually i actually think this is this is actually quite 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 good and like you said paul i mean execution wise it's it's not not quite there uh, one one of the one of the reasons it, it and, and I mentioned this off off recording as well um, that you can you can definitely draw parallels from from this as a concept and as a film with sort of uh, cosmic horror and maybe elements of Lovecraft as well with you know ocean uh, advanced alien ocean gods at the bottom of the ocean at uh, the bottom of the sea and they're incomprehensible to, to to the humans and everyone just goes mad although that you know that the the, the aliens in this are actually quite peaceful and don't want to murder everybody um but i mean as a as a concept i i, I really like it but um yeah i definitely did a 180 re-watching yeah it's the the idea is there the idea you know you go to the bottom of the, the sea 
there's intelligent life there that you know we bring you love and all that is great <laughs> it, it, it's the aliens are mr burns in that simpsons yeah. episode My, michael bean is, michael bean is lenny it brings us love kill it <laughs> it brings us love kill it <laughs> but it, i think the problem is is that cameron at his best and i'm thinking terminator terminator 2 aliens yeah. titanic the tech serves a story and so when you've got like the liquid metal it's serving a story that is interesting and you know the aliens and terminator and titanic it's serving a, a bigger story that he just happens to be breaking new ground and the abyss kind of not to talk about avatar again falls into the avatar thing which is the the tech is driving the story as opposed to the story driving the tech and it just feels like you've got the germ of an idea which is aliens you know actually watching the what re-watching it i was going maybe denis villeneuve likes the abyss because i feel that there's a lot of the the abyss in arrival you know this idea you're coming face to face with these aliens that are kind of teaching you about your own shortcomings and that's dealing with like experiencing time differently and actually i think yeah i think that his idea of like the aliens are here to kind of tell us something more about humanity and the whole yeah. thing about like the nuclear war that's looming and you know all the kind of iron curtain stuff is really interesting and i am interested in that period of time and how everybody was basically like we're all gonna die like nuclear war is inevitable and you know cameron you know, C Cameron's movies are basically him going, the environment, man. Like <laughs> for a guy, for a guy who makes massive, expensive films that make lots of money, he is just a big hippie at heart. <laughs> he is, and that is what the film is, and I quite like that. But man, the characters and dialogue are not great. Uh, well, I will, will say as well that, that you know. Uh, the, the parallel between Arrival is actually, I think, quite fitting. At least, at least Arrival has fucking a, like aliens that you see half the time, in it, and it isn't just just people chasing Michael Bean around a submarine or or a base or whatever. It's just it, uh, it's ludicrous. His scripts are usually quite good. He is. I do think James Cameron generally is a good writer. I th Terminator's got great dialogue. Aliens has great dialogue. I think Titanic has pretty good dialogue in it. I think Titanic's got some good lines. Terminator 2 has is quotable as hell. And also the emotion of those movies works. The emo the love story between Sarah Connor and Kyle Reese in the Terminator works. Uh the the mother daughter stuff in Aliens works. The father son stuff, you know. The fact that at the end of Terminator 2 you're crying because a robot says I know now why you cry and does a thumbs up as he's lowered in, and you're and i'm there sobbing my eyes out going no because it's his dad and you know titanic is titanic it's a great tragedy this one i'm just a bit like eh. it's Marriage it's strange because it's sort of like i say this in the middle of our series obviously there's two films that we're not doing because we've already done them um but it, it's such a weird one when you look at his like career as a whole. And Piranha Two, you know, you can have that conversation. Is it his? Is it not? All that sort of stuff. At least you could say it's the first one, and that he's an inexperienced director. There's something about the Abyss that just stands out for the. I don't want to say the wrong reason. It's it just stands out so awkwardly amongst his other work, and even some of the the, the minor things, not behind the scenes. I'm talking against box office yet, but it's like the only James Cameron film not to be the number one when it opened at the the cinemas, which is. A remarkable credit to his other work and in so much of his work he knows he knows what the audience wants he is so good at writing to the audience it's why his films are so successful he knows what cinema goers want to see he, he he'll write it that way and he'll direct it that way also he won't and then he'll obviously say the famous final part is that ultimately i, I make something that i want to watch myself and the abyss, uh, and I try and avoid the personal life stuff again because I try and not to do that too much on these sorts of films. But it's clear as day like there were marriage problems before and making this film, and obviously it ended very soon after. Um, I wonder how much of this was his personal life reflecting on screen because you do have directors that do that where they'll project an image. Uh, Spielberg, who we've obviously done last year, 
Uh, now, time of recording, I've not seen the Fable ones. I don't think I would have actually by the time it comes out. I'm going to wait till it opens now. Um, that's obviously, you know, a, a traumatic part of him growing up is is the, the father, so which is evident in decades worth of his films. And it's very common for filmmakers to do this, which is why I'm always concerned about the dead wife of Christopher Nolan, considering his wife is his producing partner. Run, um, run. Well, this is this is this is this is, this is it's run, incredible. Run. Like it, every film, almost every film, it, it, it's insane. And this is the one where you know, not to compare it to Spielberg again, but he always talks about Dem Temple of Doom's the big one for Spielberg, isn't it? That looking back where he was at that point in his personal life, he always cites Temple of Doom as like something that sticks out, which I think is unfair but understandable. Um, the Abyss, I feel that it, there's a combination here of personal issues and his ego, that he's made these two killer films back to back, The Terminator, he's done the sequels to Aliens, everyone hated him on Aliens, and he proved them all wrong because he made a great film, it was successful. And I, I feel that there's something in this that went so far into his head, and the abyss is next. I can, and I, I feel that the approach to this film, off viewing it, this isn't off research. Obviously, bits of this are research. Forty percent of this film is shot underwater. The approach is like, no, I can imagine the shooting conversation. No one said turn it'd be a hit, and it was. No one said I could do an alien sequel, and it was. And now everyone's telling me I can't do an underwater film, and I'm going to do it. And I feel. That is a fundamental aspect of, of me, for me personally why this one didn't work. That, and I'm I'm going to be blunt and put, poke the obvious that the audience doesn't care about. I say it doesn't care; it's really disrespectful. But the general audience, the movie going audience who make these films, big films, big releases, don't care about a concept like the abyss. I'm not saying they don't care about water or anything in that respect. I feel there's something fundamentally missed from him selling this to the mass public against selling it to himself and judging off the the behind the scenes shenanigans which we can talk about i think that's also horrifically clear um but i'm kind of curious on your thoughts like do i am i fair in like observing that considering it was my first viewing yesterday of this and i knew as i said nothing heading in except the behind the scenes chaos yeah, I mean, to, uh, yeah, I, I, I definitely, definitely agree with the with the sentiment. I mean, obviously, uh, yeah, every, everything we sort of talk about is obviously all, all sort of speculative. But um, yeah, I would, I, I would, would pretend would would agree with that. I mean, in terms of in terms of audience, you know, word of word of mouth is always still still a big big key factor in uh, in 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 box office. Um, and I mean, the nicest thing anyone can say about this is probably that it's really boring um and i think maybe that's a that, that's probably a key factor as well um obviously the, you know I don't, I don't know i don't i feel like i'll rag on this a, a bit too much so i'll go into stuff i actually did like about it um, <laughs> for a very very brief moment um so uh the design of the aliens really fucking cool Really like the the alien design. Um, they're really interesting. You know the the the, the vibrancy of the color is really nice um, for for them. Um, and you know for for how ludicrous and non nonsensical the ending is, I quite like it. Um, and I like where uh, Ed Harris meets the aliens. But everything else is just like. Oh, and and of course the the CGI use, which we'll come on to, which I'm sure we'll come on to later. But um, those are some, you know, before before we go into heavy ragging, uh, those are some likable bits. Um, but just going back to your point, George, I, th I think you're, you know, you're 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 spot on with that. Uh, yeah, I think I think the thing is as well is that you can have a big idea, you know, the idea, the alien idea, but. People, the characters are what really should drive the idea. And the basic concept, you know, two people who are fundamentally in love, you know, the Ed Harris character, the Mary Elizabeth Master Antonio character. And I think her performance is very good. I think her performance really grounds the film when it falls apart. But the idea that two people are fundamentally in love but just cannot make it work is a good idea to hang a sci fi film on. And it's, you know, that should really if he'd 
I feel like he didn't do enough drafts of the script. I feel like this is like a second, maybe third draft, and he needed to maybe a fourth and a fifth. Because yeah. that idea that Ed Harris is in love with Mary Elizabeth, Mary Elizabeth is in love with Ed Harris, and they, it, the marriage has fallen apart. And through this experience, they kind of realize actually they do love each other is a really beautiful idea and one that could really, really work, you know, and in the same way that Terminator is a horror movie, you know, sci-fi horror film, but actually at the center of it is this destined love story between Carl Reese and Sarah Connor that they're fated to fall in love and that love creates, you know, uh, John Connor is really interesting. And that bit with the alien that's made of water shows up and it like looks at them and it's like a, and it, it, it makes her face is really kind of haunting in a way. It's really, you know, the alien takes the form of, of this symbol of love is really nice. But I don't know. Yeah, the army's bad. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, it, it's like, when you can't think of anything else, he just goes, and also, I really hate the army. Yeah. We guessed. Like, Do you know what, James? Yeah. The army, four man. Of four yeah, of your films are about how the army are bad. And you know what? I agree with you. They're not Do very think... nice people, are they? Do you think you saw how much people loved all the colonial marines? It was like, no, I've got to tell people that they're actually bad people, military people, even though we Maybe. used made an amazing one which are full of legendary characters, thanks to the personalities of the actors that made that film. Aliens is successful, as we've all said at the start, because of characters. But the reason those characters work is because of the people playing them. And I'm not here to, to, to diss on the performances. You mentioned Mary Elizabeth uh, Master Antonio, who I think is, is the, the best of the best performance in this film. And I think she has the most material to work with. Um, but if we get into you know one of the reasons why maybe the performances aren't as great um is because Very hard to of give a good the... performance when your director is like if you try to kill drown, you yeah if you're like i can't breathe underwater i'm not a fish and he's like i don't give a shit keep swimming boy it's hard to it's hard to be in the film if you're having a breakdown every day and and this is where i'm kind of coming in like we do these behind the scenes segments on, on every one of these episodes and it's quite integral to this film but I don't want to sit here and feel like I'm reeling off, you know, like the like a military killed on duty type thing from World War Two. It's like you know this actor almost drowned, hasn't worked with him since. This actor almost drowned, hasn't worked with him since. I guess if I'm going to try and get into the behind the scenes politely, because it should be brought up at the treatment of actors when they almost do die, they're just going to work to do their job. Um, these are, and the, I, I said these aren't some people. Some people shouldn't die ever. Some people are professionals that do the stuff actors can't and they had actors doing stunts in this stunts that aren't normal stunts it's water stunts these aren't i don't even know if normal stunts people would be equipped to do something like this because of the you know the, surely it should be divers not stunt artists doing this. anyway that's the side piece on waffling um ed harris water chaos ensues water is water is the element that is the hardest to control like that's why it's so rarely used on a big scale. Yeah, you can control fire. Well, fire is also quite unpredictable, but water is so once once water is introduced to a set, it's so dangerous because it becomes a slip hazard first and foremost. So suddenly people will start slipping over, tripping over, and then you've got you know. Film sets are like ninety percent electronics, so that then you're in danger there. And it's just like maybe the miniatures, maybe maybe the CGI should have gone on that instead of Mary Elizabeth's face. There but were yeah. other ways to approach this film, I think, and I think the root of it is that 1989 is too early to do a film of this scale. Now, obviously, Titanic's. Still had issues in the late nineties, but at least that's to do with a sinking ship, not sending people, you know, I I into this extremity. And kind of some of the stuff I've been reading in the last day or so about this is quite remarkable. That the, the it was the largest water tanks ever used on a film set that held seven point five million gallons. 
Now that sounds like a big number. I'm, I, I don't, I don't track water for a living. I can't tell you the actual scale of what that is. But it was that a half-built nuclear facility that this took place. That'd be quite scary to be filming at a half-built nuclear facility, whether there were nukes in there before or not. That would be unappealing uh, to, to be drawn into. But that's where principal photography was, which I, I think is the first worry. And then you sort of follow that up with the, the, the building of these sets. The water tanks weren't ready, and James Cameron demanded that they use them a few weeks earlier, which is terrifying. Uh, as a con- And it's easy for us to talk about this you know, 30 plus years later. I guess we can kickstart with that. Um, <laughs> but the first like week of filming, one of the water tanks had a leak. Uh, and obviously the, the, these aren't small water tanks either. It's apparently there's, there's something like uh, an insane amount of gallons per minute was, was leaking out because of this. So there's clearly production issues from the day of filming. And then you add in the actors, which is the real worry for me. Um they all had to become certified divers, which is fine. That's not 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 uncommon for films, but obviously, you know, you, you look at Top Gun Maverick where they were cast in the film and they went to military school. Aliens we spoke about last week, the Marines were trained by SAS people. That would that the concept of being trained to be a diver to do a film set in water is probably not a bad ordeal until they then realize like what's obviously going to follow in, in the coming weeks and, and months. And I, I guess we're just going to kickstart with Ed Harris, who refuses to speak about this film and has only ever done so, uh, before you mentioned before, went live in 1993, which was for a behind the scenes like video documentary. He has not ever spoken about it since. And the closest I can find to a quote from this, if I just bring up my notes once more, asking me how I was treated on the abyss is like asking a soldier how he was treated in Vietnam. Um, now I, I'm gonna. I've actually not seen a lot of Ed Harris films, which kind of annoys me because I like him from what I've seen him in, and I know he's that he's, an, he's a good yeah, he's a very good actor, very good actor. And, Harris fan. He's great, and every and he's very varied in what he can do as well. And I think as a lead in this, he's a very. I'm glad it wasn't like not disrespectfully to Michael Bean. I'm glad that. The, the logic of this film is that these are like, you know, you've got some army personnel, but essentially you've got the normal folk. The, the goal was for them to be scientists, but obviously they're just staff that are already working on, at this uh, on this place. Ed Harris fits that, that it's not Arnold Schwarzenegger. Like, yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna stop the water monsters. Like, look at me ripped in this job where I shouldn't ever look like this. Ed Harris sort of climatizes into his role. Is that a strange thing to talk about? Um, no. Not really. I mean, I mean, you, I, I suppose my 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 thing. You're picking like there's only really two two performances of any any note in this, which is you know Mary Elizabeth Mastrantonio and Ed Harris, who gets out outshone by his by his female female counterpart. Um, didn't they? I I, re- I did read somewhere that they pushed Michael Bean for best supporting actor actor at the Oscars, but were unsuccessful. Hey. Well, that's that's I read that somewhere, and it's like, well, he's shitting me. I'm so sorry, <laughs> but he is quite yeah. bad. I don't like him in this. I no. Uh, if, you, if you if he was ever going to get Oscar nominated, it would have been supporting actor Terminator, supporting actor Aliens. This he's, film, I mean, he's bad. Talk about the talk about the characters, like not as characters as a whole. Michael Bean is the only cast member that has ever worked with James Cameron since. And now James Cameron likes to use the same people over and over. And since this, he has made one, two, four films. Five Five films. films. The fact he made five films in like 30 plus years is ridiculous. Very well. Um, Thanks, Avatar. Um, But I think this is when it's quite telling with this kind of production that what what this cast has gone through is probably not your normal cast Mm -hmm. behind the scenes issues that when it's a matter of life and death, and you know, we, we not necessarily we haven't really joked about this because we know the seriousness of it. But the fact that my approach is like someone younger, like we know that American shooting laws differently. How this was never shut down 
Like I know that had social media, not to talk about the, the good thing about social media, but if social media existed in 1989, around then, this film would have probably been known. There would have probably been stuff oh, yeah, leaking yeah, yeah. left, right, and centre, like modern films. And I'm kind of amazed at how much of this was allowed to continue because everything I've read, it, it feels like, not the IMDb trivia page, but when you're researching these actors' interviews, it's quite disheartening to see this because we're doing this series because I'd like to go through the James Cameron films and his career is an incredible career to look at. And I genuinely believe that this film is the lowest point of that for him as a person, for the cast, the crew, how they're treated, the film, the quality of the film itself. And it's quite tough to talk about that. The fact that James Cameron almost died. And the reason he didn't is because he quote punched someone, which I fundamentally like can't compute. Like can't, I'm not a robot or, or anything, but the story is is that when he was diving, there wasn't enough oxygen, and as he came back up to the surface, they tried to like decompress him or something. To which he punched the guy in the face because he had no, he had he he basically no oxygen left. And I'm just there like I, I'm just sort of just sat there like how, like. I know there's probably scraps on film sets a lot. It's probably not hidden. It's like football. Footballers scrap all the time in training. You just don't see it reported because it doesn't happen on the pitch. But there's just something well, quite people, people unnerving about this. Yeah. Like, like, yeah. any, like any work environment, you know, like you could work in an office and, you know, somebody doesn't put a wet floor sign down, you fall over, you break your ankle. It happens. Is why there's insurance on film sets. Like, you know. You talk to any actor, oh, if you if you got any actor and you went, have you ever hurt yourself on set? You'd be like, yeah, I was doing X, Y, and Z and, you know, I tripped on something and I fractured something. You know, the people got hurt making Harry Potter movies. People get hurt, especially big films with stunts. You will get hurt. It just, you know, Tom Cruise, you know, yeah. Jackie Chan. Craig, Jackie Craig and Bond, a classic. He, yeah. he always got injured and didn't like it. Yeah, Jackie Chan constantly knocking himself out because he kicks a dustbin lid into his face and it's like be careful for god's sake you're the lead but there's a difference between oh you know like i, I remember reading somewhere like thor 2 which is not a great film but like late uh, jamie alexander when you know to talk about water she slipped on the london set because it was wet and she like fracked she chipped a bone in her spine or like in her elbow or something that happens you're going to hurt yourself. I've worked, you know, I've never worked on a film. I've worked in a cinema. I've hurt myself plenty of times falling off things, falling over things. There's a difference between just an accident and doing stuff which is fundamentally dangerous. Being yeah. submerged that deep that you need to decompress is not safe. It's There's a reason why to be a diver, you train your whole life. It's a vocation. To, be, to work in submarines is a vocation. It's. It just seems like unne it seems unnecessary, you know. A bit like, and also we're not that far after Twilight Zone, you know, where three people are killed, flat out. You know, one is crushed, two are decapitated, because the director's like, I don't give a shit. I'm gonna have massive explosions, and the helicopter's Elite. gonna be whirling two thing, and it's like miniatures illegally having kids on set as well, which and that's why two of the victims. I know people rag on CGI these days, but it's like, yeah, but CGI has made it safer for people to make movies. The Abyss now yeah. would be a lot safer than The Abyss in 1989. And you think, like, it's unnecessary for Ed Harris to have to swim until he can't breathe. It's not necessary for actors to have to be put in those situations. They're just actors. Mm. Like, you know... Some actors are very into it. Harrison Ford is like, oh, yeah, no, I'll fly a plane. I love flying planes. Tom Cruise, yeah, no, I'll jump off this building. It's like, yeah, but that's a choice he's made. Tom Cruise chooses to nearly die. That's his own stuff. But then, that's not. But the, the, Harris is not, not yeah. an acting man. He's, a, he's just a, an actor, you know. And notice, yeah, yeah. he's not done a lot of like lead. Ed Harris since has not done leading. He's been in genre films. You know, he's, he's in The Rock. He's good in The Rock. He's in National Treasure. He's good in National Treasure, but he's not jumping off buildings. He's clearly gone like, no, you'll never get me in a tank again. Yeah, get a stunt. I mean, uh, I mean, there's 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 a good you know, and you bring up a, a, a great comparison there, there, there Paul. You know, to, 
for speaking with a, mo a modern example, obviously Tom Cruise produces the, the Mission Impossible films. And, you know, he, he does all this crazy stuff because he, he wants to, you know, thrill the audience by showing them that, yes, the your, your lead actor is doing the things that, that their character claims to be doing. But, you know, he never I, I've never heard of Tom Cruise putting another another actor in in danger because you know, in in danger because oh you have to do this because it's because it's um because it's for the film uh, I've, yeah never 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 heard that but and and uh, brings up a brings up a good a, a good point you know you're at the end of the day everyone is making an entertainment product and this entertainment product is not worth getting her or losing or potentially losing your life over. Yeah. It's it's a film at the end of the day who who really, you know, we all enjoy enjoy watching watch but really who 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 cares. Um and that's a bit blase to say but um but yeah, I mean you know, you're you're there to do a job not to get fucking hurt. And obviously things things do happen but you know, just some some comments in. And some of the some of the behind the scenes. So even stuff like, obviously, there's there's that um, fluid oxygen scene uh, Ed Harris breathes in. But before that, using live rats to to experiment on and do this breathe is like is completely fuck it. No matter you know whether whether the the rats survived and lived to old age, it's fucking unnecessary. And just do that with a with a fucking model rap. And come on, there's no, absolutely yeah, there's no need to do it as well. The eighties yeah. is the golden age of like models, and you know this is the same era as the thing where it's like, look, we can make you believe an alien comes out of a man's yeah. face. Get a model rat. Rats are very easy to get. Toys of rats look very realistic. You know, That's... animatronic people. If the film yeah, yeah. works, you believe. You know, no. Like, I know that the thing is not real, but the movie involves me enough that I believe it. And it, yeah, I, hurting animals, just, killing animals for films is unnecessary. It's like that's not. Yeah, necessary. yeah, yeah. It does, yeah, that does. That does bring up a bring up a. a just sort of waterboarding you know, around. Yeah, it's just unnecessary. And, and it's, put, it putting it in the bag, putting it in the bag as well. Like I'm. There's going to be some weirdo crying about the woke left or some nonsense. But, um, you know, when you see things like, is it Peter, how they're pronounced, the charity, whatever. I've seen them criticize things that are just for the, the PR of criticizing something nonsensical. Like, it's like this day of the year and, and they cry about something. But then people will be signing on things like that. It's like a rat, like, it literally looks like it, it's, it, it's for the, I say the audience's pleasure. It's not really anyone's pleasure, but. The director wants to them to stick a, a rat, put some liquid in it, and put it on camera to put it in the film. This isn't a documentary. This isn't. This is. This is a, a, a drama or sci-fi, whatever you want to call it. But, and it kind of in, in lieu of the actors, they have picked this role. They are actors choosing a role to work in a film they would like to be in. They are auditioning for a role they like to play to work on a director they probably respect, who's done some great films to lead up to this. They did never at any point sign on for any of this. They're probably told there'll be some physical diving, there'll be some water stuff. Great. The scale of that, I would guarantee, was not ever, ever explained to them. Was not probably gone into detail. Yeah, you One of the things. Can you swim? Yeah. All right. Because 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 it's a water film, so there will be swimming involved. It's a bit like a you know like Titanic. You'd be like, all right. So the film's called Titanic. It's about a ship that sank in the sea. All right. I'm going to be wet then. Yeah. All right. Fine. Fair enough. I expect. To have to do some scenes in water, I don't expect to nearly freeze. I don't expect yeah. that. Eat the water. I'm a human being, yeah. and I'm in and water for twelve hours a day. I, it needs to be warm, otherwise, I'm going to get hypothermia. And the same with this. It's like, okay, I can, you know, I can hold my breath underwater. I'm, you know, and I, you, you would expect, you know, to go underwater with the diving gear a bit, like a swimming pool. Take it off. Do the scene for like twenty minute, twenty seconds, or a minute. Yeah, and then to cut you know the magic of movies makes me believe i can do it but i i would never expect a, as an actor to have to go to depths where to decompress i'd be like i'm an actor 
I, I learn lines and then I make you believe I care about things. I'm not, I'm not a yeah, diver. <laughs> there's, yeah, there's, there's, there's obviously, you know, obviously rough shoots and grueling shoots that can sort of take its, take its toll emotionally on people. But I, I don't think ever to, ever to, ever to this, this sort of scale. I mean, obviously you'll, you'll have a rough, maybe a rough, rough week or rough couple of weeks but you know if you try and lift everyone's spirits and things on and everyone's sort of really not we'll get through this together it didn't it from the from the sounds of it or looks of it behind the scenes on this it, it just wasn't didn't seem like that at all and james cameron it's either his way or the, or or you know you're out yeah is what, is what it seems and like. that's and and that's what not necessarily scares me as such but it's so fundamentally wrong and I think what sort of follow-up I've, I've joked about in other episodes, he visited the Ron Howard site, I think, for Apollo... Oh God, I don't know. There's so many Apollo 13. Places, yeah, 13. Where he couldn't believe that Ron Howard got on with the crew and the actors. And I, I, I'm, I'm so fundamentally curious about this still that I've known this for a few months now. As a director... How can you have made? Because when was that? Ninety four or five? Did that film come out? Sorry, I've not actually seen this on the shelf behind me to watch. Ninety six, maybe, but it was mid nineties. Yeah, he's made four, probably four films at this point, and he is astonished that a director gets on with the crew and cast, and it just really makes. And I'm not talking about like mental health because that is a big part of it, but working on a set. And I know that UK sets are different to US sets, whatever. But the fact that someone has made four or five high budget films at this point of their career, and they and they are shocked to that discovery, has really astonished me about a lack of a lack a complete lack of knowledge from Cameron. That you know, and obviously, I don't want to talk like we're in the nineties now. Like when you see him in interviews today. He is great. He is funny, and he enjoys talking about studio heads, which are great because we know they're equally as despicable. But I do think he genuinely regrets a lot of his past actions, and he says that that was a real waking up point in the mid nineties. But it shouldn't have been that long after. It really shouldn't have been, and it, it just there's this stuff we'll probably never find out about. Um, which is also even worse. hilarious because then you hear about Titanic and it's like you haven't learned anything, have you? <laughs> and this is yeah. kind of it. And and you know we're going to get there. And, and I don't know, Didn't like he, part of me, he had like, the opposite problem that Ridley Scott had, which was like he he was when he did Aliens, he was used to American crews, and then the British crew, he was like British hate crews him. hated him. The, he hated Whereas, them. They hated him. And he Ridley he Scott didn't like the fact they had breaks Americans because he didn't like Blade Runner. Where he was yeah. like, no, in England we do this. And they're like, you're not in England, Ridley. You're in America where we do it like this. So they kind of had the opposite issues. Whereas he's like, because, yeah, he had that thing of Ridley Scott was like, no, I like to sit at the camera and I like to do this. And they're like, that's not how it's done in, in this country. And James Cameron had the, you can't be going for another tea break. What? Another how one. They have workers' rights in the year 1986. Yeah. Um, you know, Another tea break. Similar, Come on, lads. <laughs> similar conversations today without getting too political. Um, yeah, but, um, actually, no, there's, there's a fucking conversation. There's a, there's a there's reason they're uh, they're taking that many tea breaks. It's because you're a fucking arsehole. But I, I've, I've got <laughs> to give it to them. They like, I think at least the aliens film sets are like war. I'm like, like film sets are not like war. They're not like war at all. It's they a should... fucking it's a fucking job, isn't it? It's just it's. It's oh, a they're, just local. Oh, they're all they're all local. They all live locally to, to Buckinghamshire. It was shooting also, a think, drop at the studio. It, it wasn't I think looked through as a crowd. Everybody is a sensitive artist like him. Like, no, you're a sensitive artist. Writers are artists. You know, there is an art to what they're doing, but ultimately, like, you know, the department heads maybe are, you know, oh, the art of film. But the guy building the set is a builder. And he might really love film, and he might know a lot about film. But ultimately, his job is to turn plywood into metal, and to turn, you know, a tiny little studio in miserable England into the far off land of of you know uh, aliens or whatever. That's his job. And in, yeah, in England, they're just like you know, they're builders. Of course, they don't care about your artistic vision. Their job is to make the tank. 
they don't care about your oh when i was 17 i had this vision of these aliens and true love true love is what will save the world they're like cool where am i putting this rebar now where does where does this bit go because i need to build a platform for love like it's i yeah i think uh, the fact that he yeah ron howard ron howard's like the most softly spoken man in the world yeah. like i can imagine he's the his nicest guy like everyone he's genuinely <laughs> yeah and like I, I, and this is where i'm kind of trying to like what are the sets of james cameron visit that's my other question do they just not invite him to film sets? Like, was Ron Howard the first ever guy that probably was told, like, James Cameron's a massive twat? Invite him to the set and, and show him what it's like to be nice. Whereas, I'd imagine other directors are like, we don't want this guy to be near where we are at the moment. Uh, I'd, and that's... Invite him. I'd invite him and be like, look how great I am compared to this lunatic. You think I'm hard? <laughs> this guy is insane. All I'm asking and, and... is for a third take. <laughs> And this is what's amazing, like getting to Cameron now, where you know he's left Hollywood, he lives and resides in in New Zealand, he's built uh, studios there, he owns loads of land that's left, I think, like untouched for like nature to to do its thing and whatnot, and, and essentially have no humans. And it's amazing that, as you said earlier, that he's very much a hippie, and he spoke about that when he pitched the first Avatar. The studio heads like, "Get this hippie shit out," and he goes, "No, but I am the hippie." And then like, but then it's this guy who we're talking about, and it, there's just something so, there's something, something weird so about weird his and... sensibility, and yet he's like, look, I believe make a maniac. And, I believe in peace and love, and I believe we should love our planet. But you are mistaken if you think I don't want to blow stuff up in my movie. We gonna blow stuff up, like because Avatar is like the ultimate, like if only we can praise the trees and love our planet and be connected through our tendrils. Yeah. That's beautiful. It's like, but here the comes the minute hour of the film. film. Yeah, the final hour of the film is dive bomb, destroy, look at the fire. And it's like, you are very conflicted in what you like, aren't you? Because you want the peace and love, but you enjoy the destruction. And that's kind of it. Uh, and, and, and that's it's... what the is. I love peace and love. But I also want to see Michael Bean try and kill you. Yeah. And, and the just... nuclear war of it. It's it's just so. It's a weird one to talk. I mean, we've gone over an hour, um, but as in this one's this one's going to be different to all the others. Um, but we, we spoke about a couple of the characters. Um, I know really we kind of characters. mentioned. There aren't and any. This is this is this is the problem. This is the problem I have that when we've done these, you know, last week, Tom, we spoke about how great the Clone Marines is, how many amazing ones there are within that. And for this, I I couldn't tell you anyone's name. I didn't even know Ed Harris was called Bud. I thought it was just oh, it's Ed Harris, and I, blue collar guy, blue collar. Yeah, wife. and and it's it's Army the fact man. that James Cameron knows this because he wanted scientists and he thought scientists wouldn't be, no one would basically want it to be a team of scientists. Which I, I don't I don't think people care that they're, they're whoever they are anyway because they just it doesn't matter what their profession is if you don't make a good character if they're not developed no one's going to care about them or remember them. It's not like Star Trek where you have, is it like the red shirts or something? Like oh, the yeah. ones that will die because that's the purpose of them. Like a you know, like a clone or a stormtrooper in Star Wars. They're not meant to be developed. They exist for that reason. And in this, like there's a whole crew left by the end of the film. I don't know any of your names. I don't care. The rats survive though. And it's just... It's bizarre because you remember in other Cameron movies, admittedly, I, I could not tell you the other characters in Avatar. There's, I know Natiri, Jake Sully, Quaritch, Grace. But you're naming them. You're naming them though. That's it. I only know those four. Then there's, then there's. But but you still you've still um, named more than you could name yeah. for the abyss. Oh no, I which could, it, it feels like you know there's that um, there's the the Family Guy joke where he writes a screen where Peter writes a screenplay and they go everyone here is just called Movie Guy, <laughs> and it's basically there's Blue Collar Man. Wife, army dude, corporate yeah. fella, alien guy, nerdy nerdy one. That's it. They're, they're stock characters. Whereas they're stock characters in Aliens, but he gives them. You know, yeah. there's rough black captain. <coughs> yeah, but he's got personality though. Exactly. There's noble white man. Yeah, but he's got personality. There's robot. Yeah, but robot has a character. There's cowardly guy. Yeah, but he has a character. Like there's there's 
personality. Here, there's a mopey guy, a mopey woman, and a mopey army guy who gets blown up. Yeah, is the is it is is fitting that you know we we have been have been talking talking about um, talking about them like they're like as the actors rather than the characters that they're that they're playing. And it's and that's, it's and just... that's the behind the scenes though, because the they're, they're memorable because they'll almost died, which is also what it shouldn't be. Mm. You know, it's baffling that a guy who is known for iconic lines of dialogue, you know, like Hasta la Vista, baby, we are leaving. It's game over, man. Get away from her, you bitch. Just, you know, come with me if you want to live. Wonderful. You know, I won't let go, Jack. This ship can't even see like. I Even like my Sully from like Avatar, like there's light oh. and there's just there's there's nothing, and it, and it's not made, made me laugh. Love that line. I love this when, is Puff Dragon, but like when you get to the the end of this film, and uh, this isn't a sp- this, this isn't a spoiler for Top Gun Maverick. One of the best things about Top Gun Maverick is the Val Kilmer return, and obviously it's yeah. very tragic the circumstances behind that return. I think it's remarkable we got That's to so see him. I was in tears at the first screening when he was talking to him through the computer because I knew the fundamental backstory that it, the fact that he's even, I'm trying not to well up, the fact he's even in that film is miraculous within itself. Also starring Ed Harris. And wasted Ed Harris. Don't waste him. Yeah, I, I liked him as Admiral Kane, but yeah, I feel like they, they, were, I feel like they could have had more. Um, I thought he and, was going to be the baddie. I thought he, he was going to be more of a villain. Like, they called him the drone yeah. marine. The drone marines are better term than whatever he has in this, and um, the the Val Kilmer stuff, you know, communicating through the scheme was so impactful. In this, it's like ah, texting's not really a thing yet. Let me talk to them through the keyboard on the arm. Also, and they it's just a don't like... care at anything that comes through. Like the text doesn't I'm not speak it's English, just, but because like what is it? Nineteen eighty nine. What's Close Encounters? Mm. Close Encounters does the same thing. Aliens use our technology to talk to us, and they don't even do like words. They just do, boo, 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 boo. Yeah. and that is like unbelievably awe-inspiring and quite moving that they talk to you through computer, you know, and you get the backstory. Spielberg, his dad was a computer yeah. scientist. His mother was an art was a was a concert pianist. How do they contact? They make music with computers. Beautiful. But like that is like amazing when the only way we could talk is through noise, not words. You know, music transcends language. In this, it's like ah, nuclear war's bad, guys. Like, yeah, we already knew that. <laughs> and and this is the other fundamental issue that a big part of why this, why this film doesn't work for me is that not only did I not see the special edition, that actually has the context of the Cold War, what's going on, these aliens creating tsunamis um i've read all this since and it goes like oh they couldn't have released a three-hour film anytime well i get that and it's what you both said earlier needed another draft then uh not that audiences aren't ready for three-hour films because you know that's its own conversation different points in history but ultimately it, it you, you do have is like nothing so like yeah put Come and this out. is it. You could sacrifice some. Uh, and if I'm going to praise something in this, and this is actually what James Cameron spoke about, like since this has come out over the years, is the cinematography um, for this. Now, I, not that I hate talking about cinematography, it's, it's um, Michael Salomon that does this. Cinematography is something that in modern media, I don't want to say it's overhyped, I'm trying to say this correctly, and there'll be some people like this. Some people think of cinematography as just the camera, not the lighting, not the set design, not. There's so much more to cinematography than just where that camera is put for a singular shot. It is about everything within, and people don't grasp that. James Cameron has spoke about one of the reasons he's done this remaster himself is that as the years have gone by, he's fell in love with the cinematography for this film. And I think for an underwater film, the cinematography is pretty great for what they can probably do in 1989. And from him saying all this hype about it, I'm curious about this so-called 4K cut that's been promised for a year and a half. And it's remarkable that the cinematography even happened with the issues this film has. Uh, and you look at Avatar, which is groundbreaking. I know you've not seen it, Paul, that the new one's groundbreaking and how they've done cinematography underwater, which seen, is amazing. I've seen behind-the-scenes stuff. I've seen, I've seen Kate Winslet walking on the bottom yeah. of the tank. And, and it is, 
it is impressive. You, you, I am impressed that you could take a camera underwater. Like just the fact that you could take a camera underwater. And it's is it's baffling. perfectly like when you watch the film. The the what what's caught me of Avatar, and this is where I'm going to kind of lean into the abyss. The year is 2022, and I think Avatar: The Way of Water has just for the first time cracked what it is to shoot underwater. Um, you know, uh, unfair comparison, but sort of fair at the same time. Black Panther, the second one. Loads of underwater stuff, very darkly lit, bubbles everywhere, can't see performers properly. But that's how underwater filming is right now and how it has been. Whereas Avatar has just changed all of that. And it's 2022. This film is trying to do something similar 30 years ago when the technology isn't there. It's not ready. It should never have been done. And what's going to happen now is that we can potentially have some of these films that want to do stuff like this come out. And that is down to James Cameron 30 years later. What I would and love is for Cameron to kind of do what he did with, uh, although I don't like Anita Battle Angel. I think it's terrible. I'm not a fan. But, I'm not a fan either. No, I don't like it. And I don't I don't get the army that want a sequel. It was poor. But what I would love is for him to give a director, maybe an up-and-comer who's made a good indie film or something, and go, here's the abyss. The basic idea is there. Do something with it. Here's, here's a, it's an IP, I guess, and it's got a cult following. Here's my studio. Here's my underwater photography. Do something with this idea because the idea is there. The idea is good. The execution is terrible. And I think that if you've got a new person in it, a new director, a new cast, a new take on just the idea, underwater aliens is a good idea, you know. And also the environmental stuff is a bit ahead of its time because now, you know, environmentalism is huge you know every movie is about the environment now so doing a big sci-fi film about aliens that are like guys the environment would be great and i think that's what it needs it needs cameron to kind of shepherd a new vision in because i think his vision exceeded his grasp i think he, he was too ahead of his time and normally it works you know terminator terminator 2 titanic avatar he's ahead of the curve but i just think here he just it just didn't work out. Maybe the behind the scenes, he just kind of was like, uh, just get this Drowning. thing. I think this is too comp for what the other I mean, if you look at Terminator 2, right? And we'll get into that next week, but it's fundamentally the, the advancement of, of, of computer images. Now, great point to segue everyone quickly talk about the um the, the the motion capture scene in this, which is the first ever piece of motion capture ever done. Uh, using an earlier version of Photoshop as well. Now, I'm going to recommend anyone who hasn't seen it already, an incredible documentary dropped on Disney Plus last year, Industrial Light and Magic. It is completely about ILM, I would say up to the early 90s, because it's really wasted trying to get into modern day after they should have done. I'd love, I'd have loved a second season, if I'm being honest. But um, they, they go in detail on T2 and The Abyss. And this is what I kind of love about Cameron, is that when he's pushing the boundaries of what's possible, you can do that on the computers with technology. You can't do it filming underwater. You just can't. There, there are there are repercussions for failed underwater shoots that aren't for a failed computer system, and and that's what's kind of sad is that you've got one of the most like historic moments to me in modern cinema. That's in a, not just a, a, a crap film, but it's a film that's tarnished by it by what else they're trying to do. And I'm just in a low with it, like. Sort of segue. If you want to talk about the score, which might be more positive, because Alan Silvestri has done this, and he too hasn't worked with James Cameron since. Which, um, for better or worse, I, there's there's not issues like there was on the Alien soundtrack. We can guarantee you that. Um, but I quite enjoyed the score for this film, and and I think with like a water thing, not talking about Black Panther again, but I love Ludwig Granson. You can do something very different with a film like this with a score. You can make it stand out for a variety of reasons how you want to present this not underwater world as such, but the concept of something like the abyss music could be a real, real key part of elevating this. And I think Alan Silvestri's main theme is great, but I didn't particularly care for it during the rest of the film. Tom, I'm going to cut to you. Are you doing your usual? Listening whilst we were recording or not? Uh, for the first time ever in one of these, I am not because it's. Uh, I should have should have kept it going. Yeah, you're right. Hey, I, it's fine. Though. You watched it before, though, didn't you? You watched the film yeah. before, but uh, I, I was I was listening to it on the way home from work. Does that count? That'll do. How was it? I been? mean, 
Not one of the great things Cameron scores. No, I mean, I, it's it's fine. Is probably the best thing you can say about it. Uh, I don't think it's really necessarily necessarily great. Um, it doesn't really have any memorable stings or sort of motifs in it. Um, and I just think, you know, it's just generic. That's 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 sort of what why. My, my sort of view on it is it's quite a generic score. Yeah, I'm with you. Which is it's not, it's not, it's not one of Sylvester's best, you know. But then it's a bit like you know when you know when we were doing the Spielberg retrospective and you talk about you know oh it's not one of John Williams's best scores and it's like yeah the man has like fifty iconic scores and Sylvester <laughs> has you know Sylvester created in my opinion one of the best themes of the past decade in the avengers theme the avengers theme is now is now as iconic as star wars in my opinion all you got to hear you know dun, 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 and you're like oh avengers oh i love it you know he creates and back to the future's iconic and you know he's done a lot of iconic stuff and this is just like eh so it doesn't take me out of the film it doesn't enhance the film it just is there it works it's fine and you know me Maybe a different composer would have done something differently, but then, you know, James Horner yeah. was was probably avoiding phone calls. <laughs> yeah, I mean, you'd, a, a different composer probably probably would have, you know, obviously you can't, can't, really, can't really say, but it, they probably would have done the same thing. And obviously, that it, it just feels like a like a bit of a phone in, really. Yeah. For, for what it is, I'll, I'll get this get this done so I can get the fuck out of it. Was, was it <laughs> never that, work was, with this bloke again. Was it the abyss that Orson Scott Card wrote the um, novelization for? Was yeah, it was. Yeah, it was the abyss, and it he said that. Abyss, he, yeah. And he and Orson Scott Card, who is a human turd, he's an awful human being. Um, he said, "Oh, James Cameron was nice to me because I could afford to walk away," and he said, "I'm never writing another novelization." Because he'd like turn in drafts and James Cameron would be like, that's not in the script. You write, write what's the script. And he was like, why am I doing this? And when you've got you know, a man who hates homosexuals and thinks they should be put to death going, this guy's a jerk. You know that you're not very nice. If, if a homophobe who wants to kill the gays is like, this guy sucks. But like, yeah. it just sounds like nobody liked working with him on this. And maybe his personal life got in the way. Maybe he was juggling too many things. But it's just a bit like, eh. At a certain that's, point, that's... Maybe don't do it then. Just don't, like, you don't have to make the film. And that's like, it. If, if they say to you, there's no way to do this, occasionally it's because there's no way to do it. You know, yeah. Stanley Kubrick had to deal with the fact that, you know, he said, you know, when he, he when he was going to do AI, he was like, "Build me a robot," and they were like, "This is the best we can do." And he was like, "Looks doesn't look human enough." And they went, "Why don't you just use a human then?" And he went, "Because it's a film about a robot, man." <laughs> he was like, "Not doing it until the robot looks good." And Spielberg just went, "I just use a human." And maybe James Cameron was like, "I want to shoot underwater. You can't shoot underwater." I think they might have been right, James. I don't think you can shoot underwater. This is it, and he, and he can in twenty twenty two, just not in nineteen eighty nine. And and that's it's I, I I think we're not doing final thoughts yet, but when we do, it, I'm just, it's probably let's be honest. Calling up the surviving crew members of the abyss, going, see, it's, it can be done. Who is this? It's more the fact that the the biggest success of this film is is the fact that no one died, which is not a way you should ever be talking because we can talk about the legacy of the film now. You know, we can talk about. I mean, box office it grows ninety mil or forty seven million budget, which you know it's it's a profit at the time but it's not mega it was one of the highest grossing films ever made at this point in time and i think what's really interesting is when james cameron spoke about it recently he was really appreciative of, of people that liked it so i also wonder if there's more not behind the scenes but i wonder if him in his older age has maybe has more issues with this film maybe he knows it's not one he's proud of obviously we'll probably never hear it from him because his interviews are nothing short of PR masterclasses in, in calling journalists shit at their jobs and shooting heads shit at their jobs as well, which I do enjoy. I really do enjoy that. When they should be told that, not not all of them, I'm going to yeah. make very crystal clear. Well, it, is, it is interesting. What's the next thing he does? It's a sequel with the yeah. biggest movie star in the world. 
Exactly. After doing a sequel before. Yeah, it kind of speaks to maybe that this film, maybe he was considered not great, you know. You're only as good as you're only as successful as your last success in Hollywood. And if your film, you know, makes a profit, but the toll it took to make it, the onset trouble, all that sort of stuff, you know, it makes sense that he would go to the biggest movie star in the world that thinks he's great and to go Terminator two yeah. sequel. And this time you're the goody and you you're on screen more. We'll pair you with a little kid. I don't know. Works well, better. It Definitely does work better. Well, yeah, and, you know, and that, maybe, and, and maybe that's we, it. The guy, and maybe we. Make, and I think you know, everyone loves Arnie. Everyone's got the Arnie fever in '92, so maybe maybe that was the thing that he was like, "Ah, oh, this film." And maybe that's why maybe that's why we've not had the 4K because it costs money to make. You know, even to remaster stuff costs money. And yeah, you know. A, a, a small fan base it maybe isn't enough when you could you could remaster Terminator Two again and make. Well, he did it and it failed, didn't he? He he, he hated the remaster of Terminator Two and said so all the Terminator Two fans. So that's going to be one for next week. Um, but um, just just talking about the Oscars, <laughs> this was nominated for four Oscars: best cinematography, best sound, best art direction, and best visual effects. Winning for best visual effects, of course. That that, that scene yeah. should should win it, and I think next week in T two we'll discuss that what that began. And I said, anyone please do watch the island documentary. It's just it's just incredible documentary by itself. And uh, CGI, well, the the visual effects industry is a fascinating one because the visual effects is more than computers. It is pay your pay your CGI guys pay them. Yes, pay them. Um, them. At looking at you, Marvel, um, oh, and also please. James Cameron's oh, yeah. CGI films always look better than Marvel films. Um, and, and this is kind of... <laughs> Pay him, Feige. Pay him good. And this is kind of it. If we talk about the James Cameron segment, how can we buy it today? As you might have gathered by now, you can't buy this from on Blu ray or 4K. Um, the latest update was at the Avatar world premiere in London in December, where someone used their one question wirelessly, and that's James Cameron went to the Abyss 4K coming out. And to which he laughed and joked and said, it will be out by the end of March. I guarantee you by the end of March. Now, he did say 2023. I did clarify. Um, no, he didn't go however, March. <laughs> <laughs> that's what I'm waiting for. So the behind <laughs> the scenes of this is like a George Lucas, I always call it. He's very proud of his work. And I believe he has the, he has the final say on, I authorize this to be released, et cetera, et cetera. Obviously, we know about Titanic remaster coming out in a couple of weeks. He's done that over the last few years. Um, we know that as of recently announced, True Lies is going to get a 4K finally, which also hasn't had anything in the last few years. True Lies is done. And The Abyss, apparently in December 2021, he announced he was putting the finishing touches on that. So that was just over a year ago. It's when he was promoting his Technoir book. Um, and he basically, that's when he did that speech I mentioned about the cinematography, that he's really enjoyed getting back to it because he's been able to appreciate it more. Um, now, obviously, he the key is apparently Avatar has delayed everything that all this focuses on Avatar, which I do understand. Now that 2 is out, I my personal deep belief theory for a while is that we're going to have a James Cameron box set at some point this year. It's going to have Aliens... Avatar 1, Avatar 2, Titanic, True Lies, The Abyss, all of which are Fox films, all of which haven't been made on 4K. Now, I don't think we'll get the two Terminators. I know that sometimes studios make deals with one another where they'll like let them borrow a film for a box set if they get one in return. If anyone's curious about the sort of thing, I think Alfred Hitchcock films, you get a lot of studios swapping like Paramount and Warner Brothers. Um, but I don't think we'll get the two Terminator films. So apparently the Terminator 2 4K version is terrible, which I'll be doing some research on for next week. So that's one for me. Uh, and kind of segue into how this film is perceived today. It's kind of so I just don't think people talk about it. I think this is spoken about for for its behind the scenes problems, which I'm going to be honest, it should be. You should be calling out this sort of behavior in Hollywood. It needs the needs. You know, you can't just let this sort of thing slide. Uh, and I'm glad that you know, although it's a bit of a mess, this review in a polite way, I've I've enjoyed the review. Um, <laughs> it's been great discussing it with you two, but it's not been easy to talk about when most of the film is behind the scenes issues. 
I'm really curious about 4K release to see, not the sales figures, because you don't really do stuff like that, but... I don't think they if should it's release it on Blu-ray or 4K. I think you should only be oh, able to get it. You should only be able to get it on VHS the way nature intended. <laughs> you can only watch it on a grainy VHS. That's how it should be. Like every kid who ever discovered it in the 90s, you can only get it on a VHS. I think he should stick to his guns and be like, no, dig out your old VCR and watch it. But this is okay. it. Like I love, I, I love these look- 4K remasters. But it- when the you right see, director is fun. doing it, it like it looks good for eighty nine, but I don't know. I, I think you're going to go one. If you get ways. the right scan, though, and that's it. It goes yeah. to. I think you get the directors that genuinely care, and you hear like they call it negative scans. They they do it, you know, from hundreds of film reels that exist, and they. I think Coppola's Godfather restoration is one of the the best ones ever done. Um, and and Lucas's Star Wars were done in four Ks years before, just never released until twenty like nineteen. I don't want to say I the abyss is potential. In that. Redo the CGI. I hope he leaves. The <laughs> I think he's going to leave it. I, I, th- I think he'll probably, you know, like fix, not the grain. I don't think he'll do that scrubbing because I don't think Cameron would be into that. But I think if he's done this the right way, if he's genuinely took the time, if he says that he's envisioned by the cinematography, that it genuinely means more to him now, I would hope that the delays have been because he's put care and attention in. But I'm going to be honest, I don't think this film's going to come out in March. I've got a feeling that this is going to drop in, like, December or something silly. We're not going to get this in March. I know I'm segueing, but, um, yeah, I'm just going to hand over to you both. Final thoughts. <laughs> um, God, I mean, fi- final thoughts. My my initial initial reaction to sort of to this when I when I was watching it, sort of growing up and, and you know, re-watching it before, before this... You know, I, I I thought I actually kind of liked it, but then watching it today, and I, I suppose it was the, the the faff of partly was due the faff of actually trying to find it is <laughs> yeah, and it was like fucking okay. Oh, Our chat last night was like chaotic. Yeah, and it's it's just like and watch watching it today it's it's, it's a incredible it, it's too long for a start it's like well it's two hours what 20 minutes and easily could have been cut down hour hour and a quarter hour and three quarters two hours easily it's it's nothing nothing like for for a bunch of like for, for a film where loads of stuff happens you don't feel like anything actually happens in it it's it's kind of oh they they see an alien there they uh, beat up Michael Bean there but like what is the point in in all this like what what are you actually trying to trying to say what are you you know and actually Paul your your, your earlier comment about this is this is sort of this could have could have been a a sort of underwater love story of of like two people that have a failing marriage and they clearly love each other but and they're trying to rekindle that um, through the circumstances they're put in. It just it it doesn't have that at all. It it you know the 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 emotion of it isn't there. And usually that's that's one of the best best things about about Cameron films is is the sort of emotion within the within the film itself or within within his films. And that that just isn't there. All the characters are quite bland. Uh, you can't name any of them. Uh, and also just 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 to point out. Uh, and apologies to anyone that has this name, but who the fuck calls someone coffee as a as a name? It's 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 stupid. Yeah, <laughs> I, I I had to when the schedule was coming in, and I was like, he's surely not actually called coffee. Yeah, yeah. I, I just. Maybe there's like uh, one insanely devoted. Apologies, yeah. Just... Apologies to anyone that is called coffee that watches this or watches this in the far future, but your name is dumb. <laughs> when we discover you get you've gotten cancelled for saying uh, the name. Yeah, oh uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's true. Yeah. <laughs> I will never say see that me I again. People called coffee are cool, and it's a nice name. <laughs> Let's just say the spelling. It, it's C O double F E Y. It's not a, mi- a mispronunciation of Kofi, like K O F I, like the wrestler. It, it, it is coffee like John Coffee from Green Mile, like the drink, but spelled differently. Not spelled the same at all. 
And this is kind of it. Like it, it, it's a dumb it, first name. It's a dumb first. It is silly. Yeah. It, it is a there, bit like. You know, also, you're like, you're trying to make your you're trying to make your like cut like really tough like Navy Seal like oh he's he's he's, he's really really edgy and really really cool, but his name's Coffee. Yeah, it's no right, it's no fair. it's no Dwayne Hicks. It's no John. Yeah, it's, yeah. It's no Carl Reese. It's no Brock yeah. Lovett. But, I'm uh, I'm named after a beverage. Hugo it's, Quaritch. It, it, it's not compare. It's Miles not Quaritch is a cool name. Jake Sully's a bad name because it's like, oh, you might as well have just called him Joe Joe Everyman. <laughs> Jake Sully. <laughs> well, at least yeah. it's got an amazing Zoe Solana pronunciation of my Jake. At least we get that from it. So wait, I know we're not doing Avatar. I hate when she calls him Sully. You wouldn't because you Suli. wouldn't say Sully. It would make more sense if his name was Sully and she calls him Sully. You wouldn't go Sully. The U makes an uh sound. You'd go Sully. It's just a it's just a way of him going, silly natives. Fight harder next time. But again, it's it's the fact we're ending the Abyss review of Avatar really says a lot about what our thoughts on the Abyss are. My, my, um, final, my final thought on the Abyss is Mary Elizabeth Master Antonio's performance is so good. And even better when you learn behind the scenes stuff. And it's a film that's perfect for a remake. It's like, it should be like the modern version of, you know, The Thing is a remake. The Fly is a remake. The original Fly is awful. It's terrible. The Cronenberg Fly is amazing. The original Thing is terrible. The John Carpenter Thing is amazing. You know, this is a film. Oh, you shouldn't remake good films. You should remake bad films with good ideas. Dirty Rotten Scoundrels is a remake of a film called Bedtime Stories, which is awful. But Dirty Rotten Scoundrels is great. And I think that this is the same thing. The Abyss has a good idea at its core. Remake it. Get some visionary up-and-comer screenwriting hotshot. Get some good actors. Use, use what CGI can do and remake The Abyss for modern times. I think that's that's the best thing that can come out of it because I just don't think that it works. I think it's a bit bland, a bit boring, with a good performance and a re and that shot of the CGI alien water face is a good shot and that's a good scene. That scene is actually like when that happens, you are like, "Ooh, this is really something," and then it goes back to being boring again. <laughs> And that's about it. Is that and it, I would never expect to say that of a James Cameron film. It's boring. I would never expect to say that because even ones I don't like, even True Lies, which I don't like, is at least entertaining. You know, even when Titanic starts to sort of sag in the middle, it's still it's still interesting. And this is just dull, boring, and really that's worse than being a bad film. Is that it's just. Boring. Boring. It's just boring. That's, yeah. Environment, man. And that, and that's the best description. It is the worst kind of film. Of boring. Everyone loves a terrible film that's entertaining. There's there's no denying that. They are sometimes they're, oh, they're the, the best. The room is best. awful, but it's so fun to watch. The room is exactly. so fun to watch. This and, is just bad to watch. And this it's is it. worse than bad. It's mediocre. Oof. The Mad Max quotes in there. Sorry, I really want to. I'm not going to edit in the the for the, the the mediocre, mediocre. Morton Joe. <laughs> but no, and this, and I think for me at least, like approaching this, that this is the last James Cameron film I hadn't seen, and this is the one I was not dubious about, but I just, I didn't, I didn't, I didn't care. And well, I think that's, that's point as point. you said, that's what that's the worst reaction. You just don't care. Yeah, just and that's it. I've been ticking off. Yeah, you know, this year I've watched loads of films already that I've not seen before. Classics mainly trying to get through films I own. I'm not seen. I've seen things like Beetlejuice, which I loved. I've seen things like Doctor Strange, which I actually hated. But I've been chipping off these big films. But at least there's a reaction to them. This was just like, uh, okay. When you're doing the Tim Burton thing. retrospective, because that oh, is going to be the Wild West. That it's is like 30, 35, 40 films. Like there's a lot more. And this Wednesday for all the the all the kids today, where I feel old because I don't. I don't know much about General Ortega, which is apparently the the, the big thing now. But, oh, she's um, great. She's great. She's did, really you know, there was, a, there was a there was there was a chat about Tim Burton. Um, and actually, it was before Wednesday, but because Netflix never gave TV dates, we actually just couldn't organize around it. It would never have worked. It would have been too too short notice. When you do, when trust me, because 
Tim Burton's as ropey as any. Like, there's some greats and there's some bad. But this is, this is, every director has at least one. I saw that terrible guard, was it Guardian uh, thing about, um, it was about Ooh. Babylon. You know, like, every director has a bad film. David they listed Lynch, someone's um, Cannes winning film as one. Yeah, David Lynch's uh, Wild at Heart is bad. And it's like, no, David Lynch's Dune is bad. <laughs> Not Wild at Heart. Wild at Heart's good. Dune is awful. <laughs> like we do, and you know, this is James Cameron's awful film. Yeah, you know, I'm with you. And Piranha. Give up. at least we know this is fundamentally a bad James Cameron film and can't be can't be contested movies. by some politics. You, you make ten movies, at least one of them's going to be poo. You know, it's just a movie. shame that people nearly died making it. Imagine that. Imagine if they did die. You died, and the film the film you died for was The Abyss. Imagine. Yeah, like, at least if you died making Titanic, you made Titanic. <laughs> or you made Terminator 2. Like, imagine that's your legacy. How did, how did your son die? Oh, he died making The Abyss. Ooh. Can't even buy it on Blu-ray, they'll say, because you can't <laughs> even watch it in his memory. But, um, <laughs> yeah, that's... I can't even ask that, that, Harrison's memories. <laughs> that that's that's probably the the best way we can end it on actually is, is those final thoughts and kind of like we want to hear from you so let us know your thoughts on the abyss if you haven't already please do comment your abyss, thoughts man. listen if there's big abyss fans out there I'm you know and, I, and i'll say this you know we're, we're doing more home media reviews now if this does come out i will do the 4k review uh and i'll do that properly because i am enjoying it's doing bad. those unless it's you black adam <laughs> um which is um uh, which is on track to be our lowest viewed video in our channel's history, which I'm really excited for. I hope it stays that way. Um, Wait, but are you, are you telling me that the hierarchy of power of the cinema savvy universe did not change? Trust me, it, it's it's a great inside joke that I t I think I ended our spoiler discussion. If I never review this again, and, and there I was doing it for Warner Brothers. So um, yeah, that's uh, that 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 said what people think. So you know, the abyss may return on the channel later this year if it comes out. But in the meantime, maybe I'll have different thoughts on the second viewing. Maybe it'll be in a better scenario, a better situation. Who knows? Maybe it'll be a great Dolby Atmos soundtrack. I don't know. Let's see what James Cameron's been cooking because he normally gets it right. And if there's one film I like to 180 on, it's probably not this. There's probably many others I've seen in my life, which is a great way to sort of counteract that great build-up. But um, yeah, let us know your thoughts. And if you aren't angry, if you are angry, if you're fuming at, at what we spoke about the abyss, go tweet us in your rage. Twitter at Cinema underscore Savvy alongside our Instagram, Facebook and Lairbox.com slash Cinema Savvy. A link to Redbubble in that description below where you can pick up some merch to help support the channel. And you want to know what's coming next? It is, of course, Terminator 2 Judgment Day coming Wednesday, the 1st of February. That's going to be pretty exciting to finally get to. It's been quite a few years since I've seen this film. Um, akin to Aliens, because there's so many terrible Terminator films that have come out since. I just, I just stopped watching the good ones. Um, so... That's going to be really fun to revisit. There's only, There's only two good ones. I know. That's the same with Alien. That's the problem. And uh, oh, up, boo. Prometheus <laughs> is good. True though. No, Prometheus I like, but I don't really call it an Alien film. Um, Alien Three is also good. Three. Only the right cut. Assembly cut of Three is a good film. It's it's. It, do you know what it is? It's because it's not Aliens. It, Fincher. When you do your Fincher retrospective, uh, you know I wrote my dissertation on him. Bring me in. <laughs> well, he's got the killer confirmed as of the time of recording today, a release date, which unfortunately would clash with Denny Villeneuve. But aside from that, coming up on the James Carrick perspective, we've got three more. We've got T2, we've got True Lies, and we're going to end it with the Titanic um, because that's going to have its big 4K IMAX re-release, whatever. Is it high frame rate? We still don't know. Either way, there's gonna that's gonna be live on Sunday the twelfth of February to end the series on. Paul, you're gonna be joining us for that. That's gonna be exciting. Um, yeah, it'll be a lot. It'll be a lot more spirited that film, and we get to talk about Billy Zane, which is always a positive. Listen to your um, pal Billy Zane. He's a cool guy. He's just trying to help you. <laughs> best cameo. One of his best roles. It it's is. Just, it uh, is. That's not even a joke. <laughs> no, is. no. I love Zoolander is one of my favorite comedies of all time. Uh, Zoolander. And every time, every time cameo. I see him at a convention, I just look up at him. And I'm just that like it's Billy Zane. It's like but, if I ever um, saw David Bowie, I would expect Just Dance to play and it just to come up saying David, but I mean, not anymore because he's dead. But that film's full of great cameos and I can't wait to talk yeah. about Titanic. No, I love definitely. it. Definitely. I did and a one-eight from Titanic. That's what I'm intrigued by. 
And for everyone who's been watching tonight that doesn't already follow Tom and Paul, please find them both on Twitter. Tom at Films and Beer. Paul at Paul Kleinio. Um, I can't really tease what's coming up for both of you, but Paul, you have been on Yahoo recently talking about Rocky films. They're going to be on the channel. Uh, we've got Creed 3 coming out in March. We've got the Rocky 4K re-releases, brackets, four out of six Rocky films are being re-released in 4K, I should say. Um, so you've got some writing as well. Um, so everyone, please follow Paul on there. Tom, to It's been a long video. It's been longer than I thought. I just can't process all this. I can't process all this James Cameron stuff still. Like last week was like I was tired. I think I came on and really sad. Like it was the end. And I was very tired, and it wasn't even that long. The review. It could have been longer. But this week's been like fundamentally like everyone almost died. How do I talk about this? How do I like navigate through this? So I want to thank you both for coming on to to help me through it. For making me laugh when it could have been far more dour and depressing. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's gonna do it for today. As is, we hope you've all enjoyed it. Who's watching at home? Thanks to you both for coming on. Thank you for everyone watching, commenting. What else have we got happening? We've got our Last of Us spoiler discussions airing live every single Monday. As I said many weeks ago, the best series of the year aired in January 2023, The Last of Us. Nothing will top it. So that please do check them out. Ooh. and that's it that and, and you guys two. only episode two is going to be up by the time this video comes up i've already seen it um i'm not talking future tense i'm talking current tense it is i'm very excited for a lot of people to keep watching this show and i'm going to be really I'm curious week to week. The, game. So the, the, the show is my way of knowing what happened in the game because the game was too scary for me because i'm a little no, right, i'm not spoiling it i'm not spoiling it and that's if you haven't scary. played the game you're also welcome to check out our videos because we're not doing game spoilers. We made that crystal clear. But um, first episode. Yeah. Ooh, that first scene. Come on. Oh, we got, mummy, we got the mummy reunion happening. Trust me, mummy reunion. And uh, speaking mummy of Oscars, the sequel. let's make it, guys. Come on. Mummy speaking four. of Oscars, I believe our Oscar predictions video will be up by the time this video is also goes up. So that'll be me and Tate on there. I hope I'm talking future tense. Maybe I'm wrong. Uh, if I am, I'd have put it on social media. So thank you all for watching. Take care, and we'll see you on the next one.